are watching Gears. You know, one thing that most gearheads dream about is finding a classic vehicle hidden away in a barn somewhere in all original condition, completely untouched by human hands for decades. Now, that kind of stuff still happens from time to time, but it's getting harder and harder to find vehicles like that. And most of the time when you do find them, they're so far gone, you don't want them anymore. No, most of the stuff that people find are like this 67 Ford pickup. Something like this has been modified over the years. Somebody put a V8 in it, a little better brakes, and then they enjoyed it. And then it sat and started to deteriorate. Now, most of that stuff needs to be done again or was overlooked the first time. Now, the goal that most people have when they buy something like this is to get it running again and to fix some of those problems. So, today we're gonna show you how to deal with some of the biggest issues you're gonna find with an old truck or car like this that was built 10, 15, 20 years ago. Now, a lot of old trucks came from the factory with a stick shift in them, but a lot of people would put automatics in them because it makes them easier to drive. But when they did that, it means they had to do something about the hole in the floor and rig up some sort of shifter. So this is pretty common in an older vehicle. Also, they would usually upgrade the seats so they would at least have room for three people. But that's kind of a waste because nobody wanted to sit in this middle seat with that thing between their legs. Also, when they changed out the seats, that messed up the relation to the steering column. It's either too low and hits you in the knees or too high and hits you in the chin. Fortunately, there's a way to solve all these problems. Check it out. Of course, the biggest problem stems from the fact that people had to reuse their factory steering column back then. But LMC has got a great alternative to that now in this brushed stainless steel tilt column. Now check this out. As you can see, the finish is brushed stainless, so it's going to look great. Comes with all the hardware and wiring to finish it off. But the really big deal here is it's column shift and it tilts. You're going to find out how important those are when we go to put this in. Now, one other thing that you're going to need is a special rag joint, also from LMC Truck, because that's what connects this column to your factory steering box. To get the old column out, you'll need to unbolt the rag joint from the steering box, then remove the firewall plate and clamp. Under the dash, disconnect the wiring. Pull out the final bolts. And the whole thing will slide right out. Gotta love these old trucks. Now, before you try to bolt that new steering column in, it's a good idea to remove the master cylinder, the brake booster, and the hood so you got some room to work in here because you're going to have to get way down in there to mount that column and adjust your linkage. This also gives you a chance to look at the master cylinder and the brake lines to see if those need any work. Okay, at this point we're ready for the new column and it's designed to just slide in place of the stock piece and connect to the steering box with the new rag joint. The cleaned up and painted firewall plate and clamp are reused to hold it in place at the bottom and the upper column utilizes the stock mounting bolts. Now it's just a matter of putting on the accessories and hooking up the wiring. Now guys, when you find some hacked up wiring, make sure you take the time to fix it now. Don't just put it aside and think you're gonna get back in here and fix it later, because that rarely happens. And the idea here is to prevent a fire, not have to restore something that's been burned up. All right, one thing that you don't wanna overlook when you're doing this kind of conversion is shift linkage, because no matter what's on the vehicle now, it's not gonna work with that new steering column. So we went to low car and got this shift linkage, and as you can see, it's a fully adjustable rod with ball style ends and all the brackets and hardware to connect that new column to the transmission. The final touch, of course, is a steering wheel. Now, the original wheel that was on there didn't look too bad at first, but when you start looking real close, the covering's starting to come off and the thing's actually bent. Some big old boy been twisting and pulling on that thing and it kind of looks like a dog's been chewing on it, so it needs to be replaced. So we made a call to LMC Truck, picked up one of these Grant Signature Series wheels. Now this is a 14-inch wheel. The wheel that was on there, 15-inch. 
Now by going to a smaller wheel, that's going to give us even more room in the cab. And since the truck already has power steering on it, we don't need the leverage of the bigger wheel. So this is a good way to go. Now, if you're going to put this kind of wheel on, you have got to get one of these billet aluminum adapters, also available from LMC Truck, because this is designed to bolt that wheel onto that column. Now that is more like it. We got a great looking column here that actually matches the dash. It tilts to fit different size drivers and all of your shifting happens right up here. <laughs> now we're also able to deal with some wiring and brake issues, which is always a good thing. And finally, we can get rid of this mess and make room for a third passenger. If you're itching to get out and do something with your car or truck, fire it up and bring your family to one of the Gears Autoramas. There will be cool vehicles, a silent auction, giveaways, and of course, a tour of the amazing gear shop with Stacy as he shares what goes on behind the scenes. You'll even get a chance to talk to him about what you're working on. So saddle up and put the pedal down to Nashville, Tennessee and the Gears Autorama. For dates, times, and registration, go to the events page at stacydavid.com. You know, one issue that people are running into when they go to restore or hot rod a muscle car is that none of the trim matches. For example, the trim around the front and rear windshields is usually polished stainless steel, but the trim around the sides and the grill is usually anodized aluminum. Then the trim around the side windows is usually a combination of chrome plated pot metal and stainless steel. And the problem is none of this stuff looks the same when it's all polished out. Now, people would prefer the look of chrome, but they've heard that it's impossible to chrome plate stainless steel or aluminum and have it stick. Well, they've been hearing wrong because the guys at Advanced Plating have not only figured out how to do it, but they guarantee it will last as long as chrome plated steel. Check it out. The first step is a dip in the caustic tank to strip away all the old anodizing and junk. And the trick here is to not leave it in too long, because if you do, there won't be anything left. From there, the pieces are meticulously restored. Now this can involve rewelding seams or edges, adding lead solder to fill dents or craters, and a lot of grinding and buffing to get the piece as smooth and flat as possible. So a lot of the metal preparation has changed over the years, where we are now uh, copper plating and block sanding and filling every minor pit wave and ripple. So uh, you just have to keep moving uh, in the direction that the customer is looking for. Once the parts are worked and smoothed to perfection, the plating goes on using the process that works best with the base metal. When the parts are done and you compare them with the standard anodized aluminum or polished stainless steel, the difference is absolutely amazing. And the process for plating on stainless is that it initially goes through a nickel strike. Mm -hmm. And that's a bath of hydrochloric acid and nickel chloride. Okay. That is where the adhesion comes from. Then it goes back to the copper plating. The aluminum goes through a zincate and then to copper. So now you have no excuse to have dirty, dingy, scratched up, mismatched trim on your muscle car. Matter of fact, the guys at Advanced Plating have even developed a way to put chrome on fiberglass and plastic. <laughs> chrome plated fiberglass, how's that possible? Well, where there's a will, there's a way. So Now, is uh, this durable? Is this going to last? Is it going to chip off? What? No, it's not. It's a very durable process. Now, this looks like plastic. Plated ABS plastic. Tell me about the durability of this. How is that possible? Well, we developed a process where we uh, prep the plastic, okay. spray it with an adhesive inhibitor, okay. spray it with a primer, and spray it with a copper conductive coating. This is actually true electroplating. It kind of makes you wonder, 
What in the world are they gonna try to put Chrome on next? That would make an awesome shift knob. Are you kidding? <laughs> If you've got a cool project and would like to show millions of other gearheads what you're working on, you need to join Gears Nation. This is a free, interactive online community of auto enthusiasts that will allow you to learn from, share with, and encourage others, and at the same time, show off your project. There are also premium memberships available for access to special merchandise and the entire Gears catalog. If you're into mechanical things, you're welcome on Gears Nation. And who knows, you might even see your project on TV. You know, one of the greatest inventions to come down the road in a long time was fuel injection. The problem is, early fuel injection units were finicky and hard to tune. So, a lot of guys were nervous about swapping their trusty carburetor for a finicky fuel injection unit. Fortunately, fuel injection has come a long ways over the years. But even with the modern fuel injection unit, there's a lot of rumors that persist about tunability and drivability. Well, Holly decided to do something about that, and they came out with a multi-port fuel injection unit that they say is as reliable as their carburetor and almost as easy to install. So we're gonna take a look at it. Now, Holly is calling this system the Avenger EFI, and here's what it consists of. You have a high-flowing aluminum intake manifold, fuel rails, fuel injectors, an aluminum throttle body, and an electric fuel pump. Then you've got the computer and a handheld controller to tune that. You've got filters, you've got all kinds of sensors, and you have a big pile of wiring harnesses. Now, I know some of you guys are looking at this going, what is this? I thought you said this was supposed to be easy. Well, it is easy. Most of it just bolts on and plugs up. This is what does all the hard work. The first step is to take off the carb and the manifold. Now, when you go to bolt on your new intake manifold, this is not the time to cheap out on hardware or gaskets. So, for gaskets, we're using these Ultra Seals from Mr. Gasket. And for hardware, we're stepping up to these ARP stainless steel intake manifold bolts. And we're going to retire this cheap Home Depot stuff. Now, just slide in the injectors, followed by the fuel rails. Put on the throttle body. And finally, plug in your harness. Since we're converting to an electric fuel pump, we're gonna pull off this mechanical pump and block the hole with this plate that comes with the kit. And that is really all there is to installing this unit. Now, you will need to upgrade to a smaller HEI distributor because a big one like this is not going to fit. At this point, it's just a matter of plugging in the wiring harness to the sensors and the computer, running the fuel system, and then mounting the computer somewhere on the vehicle. Now, the cool thing about this is that there's no laptop required to tune it. That's what this little guy is for. You just make your choices, the computer self-learns, tunes the fuel injection unit, making this one of the easiest, simplest EFI upgrades for a muscle car or a street car. So the question is, how are we gonna top that system? I mean, literally, what are we gonna put down on top of it? Because everybody understands the benefits of having a lot of airflow into an engine. Companies like Air Raid have got all kinds of systems like this for late model vehicles. Something like this isn't gonna be right on an early hot rod. No, no. Now you can still go down to your local auto parts store, pick up one of these paper style filters that have the right look, that element's only gonna last you about a month unless you get it wet, and it'll only last you about a week. Now, what people want is this kind of filter with that kind of look. And Air Raid saw the need for that, and they came out with this vintage style air filter that features their high flowing, reusable filter element in a classic style look. It's about time that somebody did a filter like this, and Air Raid calls this filter the Concept 2.
When Stacy David makes house calls in the big Gears Nation truck, it makes for some pretty special moments. But if they can't come to your garage, the next best thing to do is check out the stuff they have online to help you out. Things like DVDs, wiring and build books, apparel and fender covers are just some of the things you'll find to help you with your project or make a great gift for that certain car nut in your life. If you're ready to get out there, build something, and then go smoke the tires on it, StacyDavid.com can help you do that. There's no doubt that hot rodding 60 style muscle cars is popular. Big engines, modern suspensions, upgraded interiors, these are all things that guys are doing to these cars. And one body modification that really makes a difference is shaving off the drip rails. Because first of all, you don't really need them. Second of all, it's a thing stylistically on these cars that's kind of left over from the 20s or 30s. So, we're gonna show you how to shave those suckers off of there and smooth down the look of the car. Cutting the rail off is fairly straightforward and a cutoff wheel or a sawzall will make quick work of it. <laughs> well. <laughs> Follow that up by dressing down the edge with a grinder. Now, even though that looks good, <laughs> you're not done yet. Now, because a drip rail is where two pieces of metal come together. You have a top piece and a bottom piece, and even though you can't see it, there's a seam line right there that needs to be welded back together. Now, you can do this with a MIG welder, but the ideal tool is a TIG welder, because you don't have any gap to fill, and that TIG will give you great penetration along that seam line. As with all sheet metal welding, keep the weld short and move around to prevent warping the metal. Once the welding is done, just smooth them out with the grinder. Now, hopefully some of you guys are looking at this going, man, what a simple, easy deal. And it is, especially on this car. Now, some cars, it's a little more involved, but the same techniques apply. And what a difference it makes, wow. Now, when you do this, you need to make sure that you're not overlooking something, because that brings up this. Now, quick tip, brought to you by E3 Spark Plugs, born to burn. Protecting yourself when you're welding is very important, and companies like Miller have a whole line of products to help you do that. Gloves, jackets, helmets, these are all obvious things to help protect you. But what you may not realize is that there could be some serious dangers lurking on your project that you don't even know about. For example, this is the typical roof seam where the roof and the A-pillar come together. A seam is covered with a soft metal called lead. Now, if you get in there with a welder or a grinder, you run the risk of breathing in lead dust or lead fumes. Neither one is good for you. Now, the lead is not hard to find. As you can see, it actually looks different and it even sounds different. Now, when you find lead, does that mean that you can't work on the car anymore? No. No, you just need to make sure that you're wearing a proper paint respirator or fresh air helmet to protect your lungs. If you'd like to learn more tips that make your life easier and safer in the shop, check out the tips page on the website. And now, Parts Bin. Since we're on the subject of hot rodding muscle cars, one thing that a lot of people want to do is stick a late model five or six speed transmission into their project. Now, finding the transmission is not very hard. Getting it to fit in the car, that's where it gets tricky. Well, American Powertrain figured that they could help out with that, and they developed a cross member that's designed to put a Tremec transmission into your muscle car. Now, check this out. As you can see, it's made out of half inch thick aluminum plate so it's strong but still lightweight. You got double cutaways here, so you got room to run exhaust underneath, which is always a good thing. And then you have adjustable ends, which will allow this thing to fit between the frame rails of pretty much any muscle car out there. If you have got a vintage muscle car and you are dying to put a modern transmission into it, American Powertrain has got your solution. Everybody knows that the Jeep Wrangler is cool, and there's a lot of things that you can do to them to make them even cooler. 
But one of the simplest is this little GT tuner from Bully Dog made specifically for the Wrangler. Now, it does all the things that the regular GT tuner does, like power and fuel economy, but since it's for a Jeep, it also allows you to modify your idle and engine fan speed for slow crawling, disable traction control, disconnect sway bars, engage lockers, and even switch from a towing tune to an off-road tune at the press of a button, so you get the most out of your vehicle in all situations. When it comes to Jeep modifications, most people think of the big stuff, but sometimes a little thing like this GT tuner from Bully Dog can be just as important to getting the full potential out of your rig. You know, one of the first true freedoms you experience as a kid is that first bicycle. Man, it becomes your transportation to the world, or at least the local neighborhood. And in my neighborhood, man, we all had bikes. And we'd stick playing cards in the spokes, and we'd suck on black licorice, make it look like we were big biker dudes, and it was magic. But a bike wasn't just about transportation. No, it became an extension of your personality. And there were all kinds of bikes out there. There were 10 speeds, there were mountain bikes, there were stingrays, there were BMX bikes, and they all had their strengths and weaknesses. And that's where the idea for the story of the Purple Bicycle came from. Because just like a bike might wish it had the talents or skills of another bike, so do we sometimes overlook our God-given talents and wish we had somebody else's talents, skills, color, abilities, because they seem to be better than ours. It's a simple story. It's a simple lesson, but something we all need to be reminded of from time to time. And now, what are you working on? Today's What Are You Working On comes from Bill Dudley from Williamson, Georgia, and his project is a 1964 Comet Caliente that he bought brand new in Atlanta, Georgia for 2100 bucks in 1964. Here's a shot of Bill with his Comet. Now this is where the story takes a twist because Bill goes to Vietnam, leaves the car with a family member to take care of it. When he comes back, he's told the car's been sold. Oh, he sold his car when he's in the military. Of course, Bill being right out of the army told him how he felt. <laughs> now, this may seem like a really bad story, but it's got a good ending because three years ago at a family reunion, the family pulled it out of a barn where it had been sitting for 45 years and gave it back to Bill. Of course, Bill was overjoyed and told the family exactly how he felt. <laughs> now, with that all out of the way, Bill started a restoration of the car. Now, check out these pictures. You can see the car had almost no rust on it because it had been in a barn so long. The body, the cowl, the trunk area all looked good. Then he put a new suspension on it, front and rear, and then he stuffed a 302 crate engine in there to get this thing running down the road. Now the interior, he kept the original four speed, the bench seat, put this thing together just like he'd had it back in the day. And as you can see here, it's quite a car now. Here's Bill with the car, finally, after 45 years, reunited with the same car. The cool thing is, Bill says that he and his wife of 41 years had their first date in this car, which is probably why he put the bench seat back in there. <laughs> oh, come on, Bill, don't act innocent. We all know why bench seats were popular. So, Bill, our way of saying thank you and for sending in such a great story and project, we're gonna load you up with a whole bunch of gear stuff, from videos to shirts to hats to stickers, as our way of saying, awesome job. Now, the rest of you guys, if you wanna get in on this, Send your project in to stacydavid.com. Go to What Are You Working On? It's Submit It. We'll do our best to get it on the air. All right, we got a lot of stuff to work on here. I know you have things to work on, so get out there. Start working on something.